Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the Bible study we have today. We thank you, Lord, because you have not left yourself without a witness. All these studies we're having in the book of Exodus, they, they teach us that you are the God of power, yet the God of mercy. You are the God that pours wrath upon the people that rebel, yet you are the God of all patience and the God of all grace. You are the God that will send warning before your fair indignation will come upon the world of disobedient and rebellious people. We thank you, Lord, because you have counted us as your own children. Because we see in all these things that we study, how you make a difference, the division between the Israelites and the Egyptians. How on the one hand, while you are pouring out your indignation upon the Egyptians, you are protecting the Israelites that trusted in you. And we thank you because it's showing us that you are still the same today. You are God and you change not. That even though your wrath is upon this world, we know that your mercy is upon the people that call upon your name. Lord, we come together again today. We want to study. We want to learn. We want to receive from you. Father, we pray that your spirit will direct us in the word that we study today in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you reveal to our heart all that we need to know concerning you. All that we need to know concerning preparing to be in your kingdom. All that we need to know so that we will be counted worthy to escape the terrible things that will come upon the Christ-rejecting, rebellious world. Oh Lord, we pray that you will help us so that in all these studies we will apply our hearts unto wisdom. Open our eyes, O oh Lord. Instruct our hearts, O oh Lord. Get us nearer unto you so that we'll cleave unto you, cling unto you, never to look away from you because we know that only in remaining with you shall we be safe and secured from all the evil things that will come and overrun the whole world because of their rebellion. Teach us today and help us to rejoice in your word and also to find grace to be obedient to your word. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're grateful to the Lord because he has granted us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. We thank God because the Bible to us is not a closed book. It is not something that is like a mystery that people read and they cannot understand. We're grateful to God because he has granted us his spirit that is always shedding light on the word of God. And I thank God. God for those of you who are here today and thank God especially for you who have been coming regularly because you know that the study of the word of God is very essential, very important in your own life. We have been studying from the book of Exodus and we have seen already that plagues came upon the land of Egypt. Why? Because they were wholly given to their own worship of idols, gods, pagan gods. They rejected the true God. These judgments came upon them because of their rebellion against the true God and because of their oppressing the true people of God. They came upon Egypt to overthrow and dethrone their pagan gods and also to bring the recognition of who the true God actually is. These plagues that we're reading about came upon all the rejecters of God and also all those who gave themselves over to false delusions. Now you see, the word of God is very clear. That God is against evil. And because of the abominations of men, he will pour out his wrath, his indignation, upon the abominable people. This is what we have heard, and we have run away from the abominations of the world, so that the judgment of God and the wrath of God will not be upon us. There is, uh, there is something I want you to notice today. That as, as we shall see, and as I've mentioned it briefly to you before, that these plagues we're studying about are symbolic. Now when I say they are symbolic, you need to understand this. Number one, these plagues actually happened. This is not fiction. This is reality. And you can see the confirmation of it in other parts of the Bible. I've read to you in some of these um, lessons or some of these uh, studies we've been having. I've read in First Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. 
I've read in Psalm 78. I've read in Psalm 105. I've read in other parts of the Bible referring to the events that happened at the time of these Egyptians, the plagues that came upon them. And so you know that these plagues actually occurred. But listen to this. Even though they occurred, there is still a time that is coming in the future. When these simi when similar plagues to these, but more terrible, greater, more terrifying, will come upon the world that has rejected the Lord. In that case, in that way, these plagues are very symbolic. After the rapture of the church, the full fury of the great tribulation will break upon this world. During the time of the great tribulation, God will pour out his wrath and judgment. It will be directed against all those who have sold themselves to evil. The plagues of Egypt, as terrible as they were, as frightening as they were, as destructive as they were, cannot be compared in any way in their intensity with the plagues that will be released upon the world when God's wrath is poured out in that period. In fact, we shall say this, that the plagues of Egypt, the plagues that came upon Egypt, are warnings to us that we shall be sure that we are members of the spotless bride of Christ so that we can escape the terrible day of God's wrath. We'll be saying more about that at the, at the end of the study today. Now, the study today we have in Exodus chapter 10. And we're going to divide the study into three parts. Point one, the terrible plague of locusts threatened and sent. Then point two, darkness over the land of Egypt. Then point three, Egypt's plagues and the great tribulation. That is the similarities between the plagues of Egypt and the plagues of the great tribulation. Let's go back to point one, the terrible plague of locusts threatened and sent. We're now in Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10 reading from verse 1 and the lord said unto moses go in unto pharaoh for i have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that i might show these my signs before him now before i go on we as bible students should by now understand the language of the bible you see, it's very important that you as a child of God, studying the Bible, should understand the language of your father. Because here is the Lord speaking here. He said, For I have had in the, his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. Now you see, when people read this, many times they do not understand. And there are, you know, this is the language of the Bible. I'm sure if you were here yesterday, if you were in the church yesterday, we learned something. Where God said in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, verse 26, verse 28, when he said, God gave them up. God gave them over. God abandoned them and gave them over, either to uncleanness, to vile affection, or to a reprobate mind. And I did explain yesterday in the service that what that means is that because God had been trying to restrain them and control them and check them and they will not accept his restraining influence and power. Because of that, he let go. He left them alone. And this is what is happening here. Because Pharaoh had rejected the word of the Lord, the warnings of the Lord. What happened? God gave him over. So that now, whatever he wanted to do with his heart, he could do. He could pull back, he could resist, he could reject, because the restraining hand of God was not there. Illustrated this way. It is what the sun does to the clay. The sun hardens the clay, but melts the ice. Actually, it is not the sun doing it, you know. The sun is shining in the normal course of its uh, duty. But then, because of the substance and the nature, in the clay, that is why the clay is hardened. And so in that way, in the providence of God, in the power of God, because of the nature, the depravity in the life, in the heart of Pharaoh, he hardened himself, but actually is the effect of, is the result of what God had been doing. Now verse 2. And Adam mayest tell in the ears of thy son, and of thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs, which I have done among them, and that ye may know how that 
I am the Lord. Well, we must not just pass over these verses that we're reading. I think God is really wonderful to us because nothing happens by accident in the kingdom of God. Do you remember that it was just yesterday we're studying about quiet time and family devotion? Do you remember it was yesterday God was emphasizing to us how we need to study the Bible and how we need to teach our own children and tell them of the ways of the Lord. Here we come again, God telling the children of Israel that all these plagues that you see, the manifestation of the power of God, of the wisdom of God, of the mercy of God in protecting the children of Israel, in delivering the children of Israel, He says you will tell it in the ears of your son. And in the ears of your son's son, what things have wrought in Egypt, my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know, that you and your children may know, that you and your tribes may know, that the people of God will know how that I am the Lord. I think it's also wonderful that next Saturday we're going for evangelism. And you see, we evangelize to go and tell people the might of our God, the plan of redemption of our God. We do all these things at home. We teach our children. Outside, we teach our neighbors so that they may know that the Lord is God indeed. Let us put all these things to heart. They are very important. In verse 3, And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Now compare that with verse 1. In verse 1 it says, I have hardened his heart. In verse 3, the people realized actually that Pharaoh was still a free moral agent. That although the sun was hardening the clay, it was because of the nature in the clay. And so they laid the accusation against him squarely. How long will thou refuse to humble thyself? Before me, let my people go that they may serve me. Then the warning came in verse 4. Else, if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locust into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field, and they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. Here you see that Pharaoh had been hardening himself. You see, this is the reason for the terror, for the frights, and uh, for the judgment that comes upon man. It is the reason for the mystery that comes upon man. Conflict with God, fighting with God, resisting the will of God is the reason for man's mystery. Does anyone suffer? Oh, why do we suffer? Because we reject God? Because we resist God? Because we rebel against him, why did all these plagues come upon Egypt? Why did they have mystery and suffering and pain? Because they refused the will of the Lord. You see, Pharaoh resisted divine light and grace. And he oppressed the children of Israel. Then God poured out his wrath upon him. Pharaoh's perverseness only served to reveal God's power, God's righteousness, God's wisdom, God's supremacy. You see, if we're fighting against God, the outcome is still going to honor God. Because the Bible even tells us very clearly, the anger, the wrath of man shall praise the Lord. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart, oh, it came to the praise of God. It came to the, it came to the fact that people now knew God more. They knew his power, they knew his righteousness, they knew his wisdom, they knew his supremacy. You see, if we fight against God, we cannot win. No, we cannot win. Who can fight against God and win? And why will you, with your feeble fear, smite the infinite granite of infinite strength? You will surely lose. The certain result will be the overthrow of the sinner, the destruction of every Pharaoh who hardens himself against the divine will and the divine voice. You see what happened to Pharaoh? He lacked the humility of the soul and God's judgment. On Pharaoh and Egypt should be a real sermon to lead everyone to repentance and submission. You see, in all these plagues we are reading concerning the land of Egypt, we see one thing. We see the principle of God's action. 
Note that the principle of God's action. What principle is that? Follow me to Leviticus chapter 26 and you see what we are talking about. The principle is revealed very clearly here. Leviticus chapter 26 from verse 14. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, so if your soul abhor my judgment, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but ye break, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning egg that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall ye shall sow your seed in vain. For your enemies shall eat it. Well, I told you already that the reason the plagues came and the reason for the mystery of man, the suffering of man, is because of conflict with God, combat against God, fighting against God. But then we've learned something also. That if man will persist in his iniquity, if man will continue in his abominations, then God will multiply the plagues and the sufferings upon his life, upon him. In fact, we notice this, that these plagues were coming in greater intensity. Greater intensity. As they refuse, a greater plague will come. As they refuse, a greater plague will come. And you know, the final thing that came is that the firstborn of all the people of Egypt died. That was the greatest of it all. Why? Because the plagues were being multiplied in their fierceness, in their intensity, in their terror upon the land of Egypt as the people persisted in evil. That's the very principle we see in Leviticus here. Look at it now in verse 18. And if ye will not yet for all days hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And then in verse 21, And if ye will walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues, seven times more plagues upon you, according to your sins. According to your sins. The more you multiply the sins, the more the suffering will multiply. The more you, the more you continue persistently in rebellion, the more the plagues will multiply. It says in that verse that he will bring seven times more plagues upon them according to their sins. According to the multiplication, the multiplication or the intensity, the greatness of their sins. In verse 23. And if ye will not be reformed by me, by all these things, but will walk contrary unto me, verse 24, then I also will walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times more for your sins. Then in verse 27 and verse 28, And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. So you can see the principles by which God acts. That if chastisement or the plague or the suffering will not change the person, reform the person, transform the person, will not make him to seek God and seek the transforming power of God and will not be repentant, will not yield unto God, that what will happen is that God will continue bringing plague upon plague, suffering upon suffering. And so you see that Pharaoh in his own case, because he continued to harden himself, he continued to oppose God, to resist the will of God. Because of that, all these plagues were being multiplied, coming upon him. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 10 from verse 7. Exodus chapter 10 from verse 7. And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Now you see what is happening here. The servants of Pharaoh, they trembled at the word of God. We're going to say this way, that Pharaoh now at this time, he had no excuse whatsoever. The magicians had recognized the power of God and they had informed him that this is the finger of God. In Exodus chapter 8 verse 19. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, not just that they said it privately, they said it directly unto Pharaoh. This is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. 
Not only that, some of the servants had already begun to respond favorably, positively to the word of God, fearing the warnings of God and doing what the Lord wanted them to do. In Exodus chapter 9 verse 20, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. So you will see that Pharaoh had no excuse at all. The magicians had recognized the power of God and they had informed him. Some of his servants who feared God had been spared much loss. And those who did not regard the word of the Lord had suffered much loss. His servants now want him that he should release the children of Israel. He should let them go and serve their God. And in Pharaoh's uh, attitude, what did he do? Let's see, you will still see the same old story, the story of insincerity in the case of Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 10, verse 8, And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. And he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with all and with our herds. Will we go? For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. It's wonderful to be a person that has an uncompromising heart and attitude towards the Lord. I want you to see the heart of Moses. I want you to see the attitude of Moses. I want you to see as a leader, he was not willing to compromise a jot or a title. Look at verse 9 again. He says, we will go with our young and with our old. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if leadership in the church, leadership in every district, leadership in every local church will take care of the young and the old, take care of the spiritual life, and the, of the young and of the old. Make sure that the young and the old get out of the world and get into the kingdom of God. It says with our sons and with our daughters. Wouldn't it be wonderful today if our programs in the church will take care of the sons, will take care of the daughters, will take care of the men, will take care of the women. Bring them out of the, out of the things of the world, out of Egypt and get them into the land of promise. Then it says with our flocks, with our herds, will we go? Even with our property, all consecrated unto the Lord, all yielded unto the Lord to serve the Lord. He said, For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, This is Pharaoh now replying and responding to the request and determination of Moses and Moses and Aaron. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go. And your little ones, Look to it, for evil is before you. Now what Pharaoh was saying here is this. If I let you go like that, if I release your young and your old, if I release your sons and your daughters, if I release the flocks, everyone, and I let you go like that, I want you to look to it because I'm going to do evil against you. Evil is before you. What he meant is that it's not going to be as easy as that. If you stay on that point, Moses, if you stay on that fact that you are not going to yield or bend or compromise at all, evil is before you. I'm going to get all my chariots together. I'm going to deal with you and deal with Israel. Then he said in verse 11, here is his compromise, here is his counsel. Not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. You see, he said, you leave the women aside. Oh, this is the same old trick. Do you know the old trick? The old trick is to kill all the baby boys and to leave all the girls so that the girls will be amalgamated with the children of Egypt. The old trick is coming up again. You can go. All you men can go. Who cares for you? But leave all your women behind. Isn't that what the world is saying? The world is saying, you go and serve the Lord and be as strict as you want to be in your Christian virtues, in your Christian discipline, in your Christian characteristics. But you leave all the women to us. And the people of the world are willing to take our women and they're willing to release the men to go and serve the Lord. It says, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Now you can see that this thing was really being prolonged. You can see that Pharaoh was really going too far. He was not willing to yield unto the Lord at all. Here we come now to the plague coming upon them. The plague of locusts that was threatened. Here is the time to send it. In verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt. 
and eat every herb of the land, even all the hill all that the hill has left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. A very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they. Neither after them shall there as shall be sought. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened. And they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees, which the hill had left. And there remained not one, not any green thing in the trees, or in the herbs of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Well, eventually the plagues came. The Egyptians had thought in the past before this time that the ordinary plagues of crop destroying insects that visit every land. You know that every land you have, uh, you know, some insects that may eat some crops, but this, this was very, very different. These people had thought in the past it was the indignation or the wrath of their own idols, their own gods. But now God sent a plague of locusts by exceeding any insect scourge they had ever witnessed. It came as predicted by Moses, so that there was no doubt but it was coming from the God of Israel, from the true God. Their gods had nothing to do with this. Their sorcerers and their magicians had nothing to do with this. And since it was greater than any previous experience of this kind, they would have to admit that the God of Israel, the true God, was much, much greater than the gods of Egypt. You see, it was at God's command. The east wind brought the locusts in 24 hours all that day, all that night. It says, from the uttermost parts of the east. Thus the winds obey the command of God. The locusts came upon the cross to consume all vegetation. This plague coming after the destruction of the cattle seriously threatened their food supplies. In fact, here is what the psalmist tells us. The psalmist tells us that the, the locusts were just literally so much, so many, they are without number. In Psalm 105, Psalm 105 and in verse 34 and 35, He spake and the locusts came. He spake and the locusts came and caterpillars and that without number. And did eat up all the herbs of their land. All the herbs of their land it, 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 it did eat and then devoured the fruit of their ground. So then you will see that it really came upon them and it was a terrible judgment coming from God upon the land of Egypt. They came at the bidding of God. And eventually uh, Pharaoh now had to call for Moses and Aaron. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. And we're looking at it now from verse 16. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Now you see that Pharaoh called upon Moses and Aaron. And let us see some points there. Number one, he made a confession of sin. I have sinned against the Lord your God. He still will not accept this God as his own God. But he committed this sin against the Lord your God. He knew that he had sinned against Moses and Aaron. But then it's more than that. He was sinning against God and against the whole of the children of Israel because he was delaying them, denying them of serving their God. The sin was not only against, against, uh, the, against these leaders, it was against the children of Israel as well. He said, now therefore forgive. I pray you, my sin, only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. He wanted to be free from the suffering. And there are not many people like that today. They want to be free from the suffering without removing the cause of the suffering. Under the severity of the plague, this proud oppressor was forced to confess his guilt and he desired forgiveness as if he would sin no more. 
let's think about this. Many evangelists and many revivalists today would have called Pharaoh a true convert. But you see, the confession of Pharaoh did not come out of a truly really repentant heart. It is time that will test conversion. You see, there are many people who might say, that one is converted, that one is converted, this one is converted. Time will test conversion. When the suffering is off, when the poverty is gone, when prosperity has come, when marriage has taken place, when the family has been contracted, and when the marriage has been contracted rather, and the family is established, when the children have come, when job has arrived, then we will know whether that conversion is genuine or not. Whether that repentance is genuine or not. We must not be too hasty in saying that a particular person has repented, that man has repented, that woman has repented. Genuine repentance will bring forth fruit, scriptural fruit, in daily conduct and daily character. Now let's see in verse 18. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind. Please notice it's very important for you as a Bible student. If you go back to when the plague was sent in verse 13, what brought the locusts? An east wind brought the locusts. Now what is the opposite direction of the east? That is west. Now you come back to verse 19, and the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind. East wind brought it in this direction, and then the west wind took it back in this other direction to go back in the same way. And then we took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Egypt. I want you to notice something here again. The, e the west wind took all the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea, drowned them there. What was the end of Pharaoh and all his chariots? The Red Sea. They also drowned in that same Red Sea because, you see, they continued pursuing the children of Israel. Then it says in verse 20, But the Lord had in Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go. So then you see that what actually brought all this is because of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. His repentance was not genuine. And now he will not allow them to go. Even though this had happened, yet he remained adamant. He was not going to fulfill his, his uh, commitment, his, his promise, the covenant he had made. And the promise he had made that he will allow the children of Israel to go. This now will lead us to the second point, darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness over the land of Egypt. We're in Exodus chapter 10 from verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. This time there was no warning. Is it necessary to give warning to Pharaoh again? He that has been often reproved, but hardeneth his neck, what does the Bible say? He shall suddenly perish, and that without, rem without remedy. And so there was no warning again. All the warnings are falling upon deaf ears. All the things that the Lord had done and the Lord had said and showing mercy and delay, delaying the judgment that would have come upon the land. You see, it did not have any effect because of that. This one now came suddenly, no one in at all. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. In verse 22, and Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Verse 23, they saw not one another. Neither, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now, you need to realize this once again, that uh, the Egyptians worshipped many gods. They worshipped the sun. Because they felt that the sun was doing so much good unto them. These people were in senseless idolatry. And you see here, God poured contempt upon the sun that they worshipped as God. Not only therefore was the source of light and heat eclipsed from the Egyptians. For the Egyptians, but the God, that is the God, the sun God, that they worship was obscured and his powerlessness was demonstrated. This was a proof. Are they eyes to see? 
that a mightier than the sun. In fact, the creator of the sun was dealing with them in judgment. So fearful was the sick darkness. It must, have, it must have been full of horror and misery. Nothing could represent this more forcefully than this short sentence that we have in verse 23. It says that they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But then look at the striking contrast here. You see, the Lord was always thinking of the people of Israel. Striking is this contrast in verse 23, where it says that even though the Egyptians they didn't see one another, the darkness was terrible. But then it says in the latter part of verse 23, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Put it this way. The Egyptians had a, dark, a kind of darkness which they could not light up. And the Israelites had a kind of light which they could not put out. Did this affect Pharaoh? Oh yes, it did. Look at verse 24. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. And let the little ones, your little ones also go with you. Now you can see that here Pharaoh was uh, just giving in little by little, little by little. Now that's how you tell that the repentance is not genuine. Grudgingly giving them the chance, okay. First of all, all you men should go. All the women should be left behind. But then the plagues came and struck them fiercely. Now grudgingly he said, all right, if you must go, if it is like that, let your women go, let your young people go, but let all your flocks remain behind. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. But we thank God for a person like Moses because he wasn't ready to compromise either before or yet at this time. In verse 25, here is the heart of Moses. And my prayer is that this same uncompromising attitude will be in every one of us in Jesus' name. Verse 25, and Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For therefore, for thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come hither. You see that verse is very significant and very, very important. Although Pharaoh was not willing to compromise a little, to say, okay, you will go, but then your flocks will remain. Moses was very, very definite. And the reply of Moses is very, very instructive to every believer. It says, there shall not an hoof be left behind. Let the Christian realize this. You see, what would have happened if the children of Israel had left all their flocks behind? Number one, when they, go to, when they get to where they are going, what are they going to use in sacrificing to the Lord? What are they going to use in being able to avert the judgment of God? Well, if you read on to chapter 12, you'll discover that it was part of the flock. They had to take, they had to slaughter, apply the blood. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And now Pharaoh was saying, leave all that behind. Leave all the lamb, leave all the sheep, leave all the rams, leave everything behind. He was telling them to leave something very significant behind. You see, there are people that do not analyze what Pharaoh might be saying, what the devil might be saying. And they will say, after all, he's giving us some chance now. Why don't we take this opportunity? Because we don't know he may change his mind. Only the Christian who is out and out for God. Will not leave any, who will not leave anything behind. That is a person that can serve the Lord without distraction. How many souls are caught in Satan's snare? They have led their flocks and herds, that means their business, their work, their interests down in Egypt. They cannot, then they will not be able to go very far in such a case because they must need to come back to Egypt once and again to attend to their possessions. When Satan sees a Christian, who is saying, I'm coming to the kingdom of God. I'm going to the kingdom of God. And then he's leaving all that he has behind. Satan knows that you don't have where with that. You'll be able to really serve God. Your mind will not be totally there. Here you are in the kingdom of God. Your treasures are in the world. What did Jesus say? Make sure that you don't lay your treasures on earth. Lay it in heaven. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. When Satan sees a Christian, go out and out of Egypt completely. 
with all his flocks, with all his herds, with all his business, with all his interest, with all his possession, with everything he has, then Satan has no hope of getting him back again. Not a part, but the whole of our possession must go out of Egypt with us. Is that so with you? Are you conscious that all your possessions are solemnly consecrated to the Lord, completely withdrawn from Egypt's unrighteousness and sinful self-indulgence? What followed here? Now, let us see what followed. We're now going back to Exodus chapter 10 from verse 27. Exodus chapter 10 verse 27. But the Lord had in Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more. For in that day that, that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. Thou shalt die. Now, you see this the first time that Pharaoh will refer to death. That Pharaoh will say, you see my face again, he threatened them and said, you will die. You only need to look into chapter 11 and chapter 12 to see what happened to Egypt. Death actually came. He pronounced death and it was time for death to visit the land of Egypt. Oh, the study of the word of God is marvelous. In verse 29, and Moses said, thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. What is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is that it's about time you release the children of Israel. You have said, well, the last plague will come now, will be gone. I'll see your face no more. Now we've learned a lot, but now let's summarize. As we go to point three, Egypt's plagues and the great tribulation. Egypt's plagues and the great tribulation. What we're saying here is a similarity between the plagues that came upon Egypt and the plagues that will come upon the world at the time of the great tribulation. Very similar. But then the time of the great tribulation will be a time of intense suffering, such as it wasn't before. That means uh, all that happened in the time of the Egyptians will be multiplying in, in intensity. Let's look at the similarities. In Exodus chapter 9, Exodus chapter 9, look at verse 24 and verse, look at verse 24 of Exodus chapter 9. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Notice the characteristic of some of the plagues that came upon Egypt. It was something they had never seen before. It was something that never happened in Egypt since the foundation thereof. Look at verse 18. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Now, that's the characteristic you'll find of the plagues and the suffering of the judgment and the wrath that will come at the time of the great tribulation. It will be a kind of suffering that had never, never been. That had never happened before in the world in intensity. In Exodus chapter 10, Exodus chapter 10, verse 6. And they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen, since the day they were upon the earth until this day. That showed how great and how terrible those plagues were upon the land of Egypt. Now let us look at Exodus chapter 11 and in verse 6. Exodus 11 verse 6. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor, nor shall be like it anymore. Now you can see that at the time of the plagues that happened on the, in the land of Egypt, the peculiar thing is that the intensity, the suffering, the wonder of those plagues was so new that they had never seen it like that before. The same thing is said of the great tribulation time. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 from verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation 
such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be can you see the similarity those plagues were so new and they were so great there had never been any suffering like that before on the land of egypt and then the time is coming when the rapture of the church would have taken place the church would have gone and then god will pour out his fury his indignation his wrath god will pour out his judgments god will pour out great terrible plagues that the bible says in days verse 21 that since the world began nothing like that had ever happened in fact it says nothing will be able, nothing will happen again like that even after the great tribulation very very terrible thing then that means that there is a solemn parallel between the plagues of egypt and a period of judgment that is coming upon the world during the great tribulation many severe plagues will be poured upon the christ rejecting world the analogies the similarities furnished between the visitations of divine wrath in egypt and those which the scriptures predict and announce for the future are very many and, and most minute let's look at some of them i'm sure that you all want to study this on your own uh, after we are finished the study when you get back home but uh, i'll go through some with you what are the similarities between those plagues of Egypt and the plagues and the suffering of the time of the Great Tribulation? Number one, during that time of the Great Tribulation, it will be the time of Jacob's trouble that Israel will again be sorely oppressed and afflicted. I want to remind you that just before these plagues came upon the land of Egypt, it was a time of real suffering real oppression real affliction for the children of israel in egypt the same thing we're told that the time of the great tribulation will be the time of suffering the time of jacob's trouble here on earth in jeremiah chapter 30 i'm not bothering to read the exodus references there on the outline because you know them already we've studied them the part we now want to point out to show the similarity are the parts of the great tribulation in jeremiah chapter 30 from verse 5 for thus says the lord we have heard a voice of trembling of fear not of peace ask ye now and see whether a man does travail with child wherefore do i see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness alas for that day is great and it says so that none is like it it is even the time of jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it what happened to the children of israel at the time of the plagues in egypt eventually they escaped what will happen at the time of the great tribulation a remnant of israel shall be saved in verse 8 for it shall come to pass in that day says the lord of hosts that i will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him that's one similarity let's look at another you see at the time of the plagues in egypt what do we find who are the figures that are very conspicuous in the plagues of egypt moses and aaron two witnesses to god's power two representatives of god the same thing will happen at the time of the great tribulation at the time of the great tribulation god will send two witnesses to work miracles before the eyes of those people that's in revelation chapter 11 turn with me to revelation chapter 11 looking at it from verse 3 now you know that one if you're in the book of revelation once you go beyond chapters 4 and 5 you know that already from chapter 6 it is the depths and the height and the fury of the great tribulation now we're in chapter 11 which in prophetic study is still part of the time of the great tribulation now look at the two witnesses that will appear at that time revelation chapter 11 from verse 3 and i will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days if you divide that by 30 days that is to find the number of years you'll discover you have there three and a half years closed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before god the god of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these are power to shut heaven 
that they train not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Can you see that? Can you see the similarity between the time of the Great Tribulation and the time of those uh, and the time of the plagues in Egypt? Number three. The, the enemies like the magicians will also be able to perform some, some lying wonders, some deceitful miracles. You see, at the time of the plagues in Egypt, the magicians were able to go along a little. They were also able to do some things that Pharaoh could have, could have said, there is nothing unusual in what Moses and Aaron were doing. Let us see that at the time of the great tribulation, there will be the deceivers that will also be able to perform some lying wonders and some deceiving miracles. In Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Reading from verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now you can see the conflict here, having horns like a lamb, on the other hand speaking like a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he has power to do in the sight of the beast. So you can see the similarity. Another thing is that at that time God will execute his sword judgments upon the world. Then water will also be turned into blood. I'm sure you cannot forget that, that one of the plagues that came upon Egypt is that water was turned into blood. It will happen again at the time of the Great Tribulation. Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, And I see it why a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea, that means the fish and all those things in the sea, and that life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Then also there will be the appearance of satanic frogs. Then also there will be a plague of locusts that shall be sent. We just studied about that today in Exodus chapter 10. And we are told that at that time of the great tribulation also a plague of Locusts will come. Only that at this time, it will be a terrible thing. You see, in the, in the case of the plagues that came upon Egypt, the plagues of, a, of locusts came with the east wind, bringing them without number, day and night, for one day and one night. In this case, it's going to come from the bottomless pitch. In the case of the locusts that came upon the land of Egypt, you know what happened? It only ate, they only ate, those locusts ate the green grass and the, and the green herbs and all those things. In the case of the locusts of the Great Tribulation period, it will strike men like scorpion. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 from verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the field, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when it striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And then also we are told that this number 8 on your outline, that God will send boils and plains upon the people in the great tribulation. Also, there will be terrible hailstones that will descend from heaven. Number 10, there shall be awful darkness. Awful darkness in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 10. 
And the fifth angel poured out his veil upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and ignored their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and because of their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So you can see that all these uh, plagues that were read about in the land of Egypt are going to come again only in greater intensity. They'll be very, very fierce. And we're told, number 11, that just as Pharaoh had in his heart, so will the wicked men of that time of the great tribulation period, they will harden their hearts. And of course, death will consume multitudes of people. See what we have learned today. The same pattern of plagues and God's judgment that came upon Egypt will come upon the world. More awful judgments sh shall be visited upon the earth in a day after the rapture, very near at hand. All this is to do something for us. It should make us search our hearts. If there is sin, it should make us repent. And then it should make us have faith in God and consecrate our lives unto the Lord. And also to be obedient to everything the Lord has been teaching us so that we'll be accounted worthy to escape all this sin that shall come to pass. Before we end the study today, let's look at one or two referen references of Scripture. In Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, let's look at it from verse 34 to verse 36. Luke chapter 21, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your heart should be overcharged with sufferings and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore, brothers and sisters. We don't know when the Lord will come. The trumpet may sound any time from now. Watch ye therefore and pray always. Watch ye therefore and pray always. The temptation will be to join the world, to become careless, to become self-indulgent. The temptation will be to go into the abominations of the world. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all this sin that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The Lord is calling us that we will walk. The Lord is calling us that we will come into the place of safety. Indignation is coming upon the earth. Wrath is coming upon the earth. But the Lord is calling upon us that we will hide ourselves in the bosom of Christ. We will hide ourselves under the mercy of the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 20. Come, my people. Enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy door about thy doors about thee, and hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. The Lord is calling us that we can get into the ark of safety. We can get into the inner chamber. We can get into the secret place of the Most High. We can come to trust in Christ, to believe in Christ. We can repent of our sins and then we can put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, let us come because the indignation, the plagues, the wrath, the suffering, the, the fierceness of the anger of God will soon fall upon this earth. Immediately the church is taken out of the world at the time of the rapture. Come now, my people. Go to the Lord and you tell the Lord you want to escape. You want to escape. You want to escape that time of the great tribulation that will come upon the world. Here is still the time of mercy. Here is still the time of the grace of God. Here is the time when you can still call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I want to belong to you. I want to serve you because I know the time may not be long. When the Lord will come for his own, you pray that God will count you worthy. To be a part of the spotless bride of Christ. So that you will escape the terrible day of God's wrath that will come upon the world. Make sure you pray and you settle every account of the Lord before you leave.